Hello and welcome to the second video for the topic delegated legislation. In the first video we looked at outlining the three types of delegated legislation, but now we're going to move on to explaining the controls on delegated legislation and to be able to assess the importance of delegated legislation. Delegated legislation is created by non-elected bodies and if we think about statutory instruments created by government ministers where there are over 3,000 made each year, there certainly is a large volume and this poses problems, particularly if you want to identify how laws work or indeed which laws there are in existence. So it's important that Parliament, who is giving that power through an enabling act, exercises some control. So. Parliament, first of all, can uh, exercise some control before the statutory instrument is created and as it goes through that process. And lastly, when the statutory instrument is created, even then there may be problems in how it's exercised, so the courts then will play an important role. There are six types of control by Parliament that you need to know, and we're going to review each one uh, as we go along. The Enabling Act, first of all, that's the Act of Parliament that begins and sets out in writing the transfer of power from Parliament to, say, the Government Minister, so it enables um, him or her to create a statutory instrument. The Enabling Act may also set down an affirmative resolution, or indeed a negative resolution, before the statutory instrument can actually be created. Uh, there may also be, during this process, a need for the Delegated Power Scrutiny Committee uh, of the House of Lords to actually examine the statutory instrument before it uh, is finally created. There's also a Joint Select Committee on Statutory Instruments which will review statutory instruments only on certain technical points. And finally, there is the Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act 2006 which uh, enables a government minister to create a statutory instrument that will in fact get rid of um, a particular law. So as you can see here there are three controls by Parliament laid out in a bit more detail. So firstly we have the Enabling Act. Now this is the Act of Parliament that actually sets out the type of delegated legislation and who can make it and in fact if anyone needs to be consulted before a government minister will actually be able to make it. And what's really important about the Enabling Act as well is that because Parliament is the supreme legislative body in the UK it can repeal or in other words uh, get rid or abolish that act at any time and so stop the government minister from being able to create that particular piece of legislation if they feel it's needed. Now, of course, the Enabling Act may also have written into it uh, one of two procedures or resolutions. The first is an affirmative procedure. And this means the statutory instrument will not become law unless specifically approved by Parliament first. This one's less common. The more common one, negative procedure or resolution, this one means the statutory instrument will become law unless it's rejected by Parliament within 40 days. So, in other words, it means that it will... Uh, require uh, an, M an MP uh, to ask for the statutory instrument to be debated in the House of Commons or to actually object to that statutory instrument if he or she finds that there's something wrong with it. Uh, the problem, of course, with this is that, as we've said, with a large volume, over 3,000 statutory instruments created each year, very few MPs actually have the time to be able to go into the House of Commons library and read the draft of the statutory instrument. So quite a few pass through without uh, any opportunity for debate in the House of Commons, which is seen as a strength. And so that's why, as we'll see later, uh, statutory instruments, which are often passed this way, are seen as undemocratic and potentially also uh, troublesome. So I've set these two uh, controls by Parliament together because they're often mistaken. It's important we actually uh, remember the differences. Firstly, Delegated Power Scrutiny Committee. This can be found in the House of Lords and is an important check and balance on statutory instruments before they are passed. Now, it, essentially, the committee looks at whether the statutory instrument uh, will work, whether there are any foreseeable problems with it or errors, and then, of course, it will make its report 
back to the House of Lords before the committee stage of the bill. Now, one of the disadvantages, it's been said, of this uh, committee is that it doesn't have the power to amend the bills itself. So it's only there to report and hope that its recommendations are actually uh, actioned by Parliament, who, of course, are the only uh, supreme legislative body in the UK and are able to make or make any changes to any laws. The second, the Joint Select Committee on Statutory Instruments, now this committee for statutory instruments only reports on technical points only and again reports to Parliament. So there are some very specific grounds, for instance where the statutory instrument looks like it's going to impose a tax or charge. Of course only Parliament has the authority to do this as it's the only democratically elected um, House in terms of the House of Commons. It may have retrospective effect that wasn't intended by the initial enabling act set out by Parliament, so again, does it look like it's going to change something uh, in the past? It may also appear to be ultra vires. Uh, now, this is a key word we need to remember for this topic, a key term, and this means, does it look like that the power granted by the enabling act by Parliament is going beyond the powers that were originally intended by them? Also, there may be unusual or unexpected use of such powers. It could be unclear or defective. So again, this is a very important check and balance, but it doesn't, the committee, have the power to change the statutory instrument itself. It reports back to the Parliament and hopes that its recommendations will be actioned. The final control by Parliament is the Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act 2006. Now this creates statutory instruments that can uh, repeal or abolish an existing law that has uh, a burden, or a specific burden. And again, there are certain grounds for this. So a burden could mean a financial cost, so again it would make sense to get rid of that law so that it would free up more money uh, for the treasury, for example, for the economy. Um, it could be an administrative inconvenience, perhaps it's just going through one too many departments, or it's... Uh, you know, again, not being thought out very well in that regard. It could be an obstacle to efficiency, productivity or profitability. So again, similar sort of reasons, a sort of catch-all there. And uh, also it could be that there's a sanction which affects lawful activity. Now, any minister that wants to create a statutory instrument under this particular uh, Act has to make sure that they consult various people. And again, the Act lays out who that is, because of course, by getting rid of a law, it's important that those it will affect are aware uh, of what that will mean should that occur. So we've looked at control by Parliament, but of course once the statutory instrument has been made, there may still be problems with it. So this is where we turn to control by the courts. Now, if there is an issue with the statutory instrument, and often this might mean that uh, it's ultra vires, which is a key term that we need to uh, remember for this topic, that means that it goes beyond the powers that Parliament granted in the Enabling Act. So, for instance, it could be that a particular government minister is uh, creating legislation, statutory instruments, that were never intended by Parliament, or essentially abusing the process. So this can be challenged through a hearing known as judicial review, which takes place in the High Court, and this is where a judge actually can examine the uh, statutory instrument that's presented to him or her based on the grounds of ultra vires. And if it's ruled to be, then this legislation will become void and not effective. So let's look at some case examples of where the courts have controlled statutory instruments that have been deemed ultra vires through judicial review. So the first case, the Crown and Home Secretary ex parte Fire Brigades Union, 1995. This involved changes made by the Home Secretary to the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme, which were held to have gone beyond the power initially set out to the Government Minister in the Criminal Justice Act 1988, which, in other words, was the enabling act for that particular power. Secondly, we have... Strickland and Hayes Borough Council 1896 and in this case it was seen that an unreasonable regulation was made because a bylaw uh, prohibiting the singing or reciting of any obscene song or ballad and the use of obscene language in general uh, was created by the local council 
Uh, however, it was deemed to be unreasonable because it meant that these actions couldn't be taken not only in public, but also in private. In the case of Ellsbury Mushroom, 1972, the Minister of Labour had to consult, according to the Enabling Act, any organisation appearing to him to be representative of substantial numbers of employers engaging in the activity concerned. Now, it was because of this Labour Minister's failure to consult with the Mushroom Growers Association, which represented about 85% of all mushroom growers, that the training board that the Labour Minister was trying to establish was deemed to be invalid. And lastly, the uh, Crown and Secretary of State for Education and Employment ex parte National Union of Teachers 2000. In this case, a High Court judge ruled that a statutory instrument setting conditions for appraisal and access to higher rates of pay for teachers was beyond the powers given under the Education Act 1996. In addition, the procedure was also seen to be unfair as only four days had been allowed for consultation. So let's look now at some of the advantages of delegated legislation. Firstly, it saves parliamentary time, so rather than the normal formal legislative process through the House of Commons or the House of Lords uh, before we get our bill passed, this is a far quicker route, and we can see that, for example, as well with uh, orders in council in emergency situations. A need for technical expertise. Now, MPs, generally speaking, are knowledgeable, uh, but they don't have that level of expertise on certain issues that, obviously, people, for instance, uh, local authorities, local councillors would have about what laws would be best suited for their own areas. It also allows consultation consultation again uh, the local authorities with um, those in the in the area itself the residents you could also say that um, government ministers can consult with uh, particular experts in the field to get uh, a view of what they think as well as well as those affected parties it allows for quick law making so again it kind of ties in with the first one but as we've seen uh, with orders in council, in emergency situations, sometimes laws do need to be made uh, far more quickly. And of course, it's easy to amend. So if there are any issues with these laws, uh, rather than wait for Parliament to actually act, the um, delegated authorities can do so far more quickly and easily. And finally, the disadvantages of delegated legislation we have the fact that it's under democratic lawmaking. So whereas uh, in the formal legislative process through Parliament, there are specific readings and the bill that's been proposed will be debated. Uh, in this instance, and particularly this is targeting statutory instruments that go through the negative uh, resolution or procedure, they often don't get debated because um, no one raises any objections because MPs uh, lack the time to go and read the sheer amount of statutory instruments that are drafted. So they will just pass on through and that of course could be a real danger. The issue of sub-delegation, uh, again it's the idea that where Parliament is transferring its uh, lawmaking powers to another authority, it's this idea that it could follow a, a chain where uh, it gets further and further away from Parliament who um, really have that control and so if it gets sub-delegated too far then you could say you end up with people making laws that really shouldn't be making those laws. You also have a large volume again that's uh, targeting back at statutory instruments and again the sheer amount of uh, instruments that are made each year, over 3,000, and finally we have obscure wording, which really you can't escape for any sort of legislation, but just like Parliament, just how um, draftsmen can make um, errors or, or mistakes in particular wordings and so forth in, in bills, um, it doesn't mean that a government minister or a local authority are exempt from that possibility either. Thank you for listening.